mention it fairly important detail. <coughs> you notice that when I said when you're static, your characters, it becomes the NPCs and the henchmen. Villains. The villain. The head guy, the big chief, the evil overlord. Not me. You get the point. Right? I never start. Have never started, will never start. Anyone tell me why? If, if you, you start, start it, it, it will die. die. If you start it, it will die. Deadlands, again, I told you, Deadlands will come up a lot. Deadlands has a character in it, from the word go, called Stone. He's even on the cover of a couple of the books. He's the Grim Reaper with pistols. Right? When you have annoyed the evil powers that be, and I'm talking the powers ethereal terms, they will send stone after you and he is ruthless. If he's after you, you're fucked. That's the general premise. He is the bogeyman. He will come, he will kill you, he will find you, you will die. Second, third expansion rule book. Someone decided to stat him. And straight away, all over the internet, yep, killed him, dead. He's the fucking bogeyman. <laughs> He's not supposed to die. No, I'm not talking even Jeremiah Storm dies and comes back. I'm talking about he's not supposed to die. I'd stop him maybe, but he's not. If you stat it, it will die. The villain's job is to be the villain. Right? If he can die because of a lucky roll, your plot is fucked. Right? Allow him damage. Allow him to be wounded, allow him to be stymed or stopped. But when it comes time for him to die, you'll know, as the GM, it's their time to shuffle off his mortal coil. You can give him whatever character traits you like, whatever advantages and disadvantages and supernatural powers and whatever, but if you stat him, he will die. The players will formulate some fucking feasible plan and all of your plotting and planning and planning is gone, and they're dead. And you can't do fuck all about it. Right? I'm, not, I'm talking sort of 1960s Batman-style Joker stuff. Right? We have to bring him back because we fucked up and killed him in Chapter 2. Right? Don't allow him to die. If it comes to it, make it look as if they have. Right? It's all part of your storytelling. But if once you've got a health stat on it, then he's going to go down to zero at some point. Right? Leave that off, figure it out, allow him whatever wounds and give him an escape route until the point when you want him to cack it and die. Are you with me? What well, your ability you want to be able to throw him on a regular basis? I mean like uh somebody if you want him to shop every stuff off stuff off that with the scuff with the player characters, but you want to give some lighting experience. Escape routes. Leg it. Distract him with henchmen, distract, distract him with grunts, and when they look around to to cap the bad guy, he's not there anymore. Mm -hmm. Dr. Evil escaping in his escape pod. Yeah. You could get scooped up and have a, his brain put in a jar and attached to a rug. You can always bring back a dead character provided there's some sort of supernatural element to your game. But the best thing to do is not allow them to die in the first place. Mm -hmm. and well, it's a bad doubles so they will for find that. a way of killing him even if you've not started it. Doubles are very good for that. The, they'll always be lucky rolls. What about stuff like avatars? Why does that have a shot in the game rather than a person who is not a supernatural enemy? You know, like a little evil clone. Yeah, can happen. Right? But at some point, you'd be best off pointing out that that was the club. Right? Um, diamonds are forever. Yep. Hogfell dies at the start, and yet he's the villain twice over for the rest of the film. Yep. Right? As long as you've got a reason for him to seemingly die, right, don't cheat the players. Right? I know it sounds like you're cheating the players, but don't. If it comes to it and they've got something on, then have some reason why something's why they're coming back. Right? 
But the easiest way of doing it is Dr. Statton. Because if he says it, it will die. Right? And this isn't fucking about with any of the rules, because <coughs> I gave my rules. I gave my rules. I'm sorry, I missed that out earlier. It's a very important thing to me in terms of the villain that I never started. Right. I suppose I should get on with the actual story, because that is, is a fairly important bit of some games. I know some people like to run a completely sandbox game. Uh, Rocky, for one, is a big fan of the give them an open world and they'll fuck them themselves. <laughs> I like to have some sort of story along the lines. So, now story inspiration can come from anywhere. And right? any story you like. And I'll actually be freely honest, I love stories. I love running stories where the players can recognise it. Right? One of my most favourite campaigns that I ran, one I venture in the middle, um, even though it was a Western game, uh, was ripped wholesale partially, this element of, was ripped wholesale partially from a sci-fi film. Right? And there was a point when they figured it out. And the point when they figure it out, you just see this little smile grow across their faces. Seconded by the old book. Right? But, uh, and I'll tell you the story for now. Right? Um, there was the shootout competition in a little town called Silver Lake. And everybody took part, and this is where Imi, who was one of my players, who was playing a whore at the time, that's one of the player classes, and she had a lot of skills. Um, she was, uh, she beat her round in the shootout by stepping up onto the podium, six people in the line shooting targets, stepped up onto the podium, dropped her large overcoat, she was completely butt naked underneath. When the timer went ding, she got off the six shots, cleared the targets, walked off before any of the rest of them went. Right. There was one player in the shootout, along with Jeremiah Storm. He was called Constantine. He was a big fella. Big fella. Didn't say a lot. Sunglasses. Big fella. Black leather duster. Never said a word. The mad scientist who created out the contraptions, he got kidnapped and sent off into the desert somewhere. And Constantine took off after the horses running. Everybody went. Hmm. When Constantine's round for the shootout came along, he'd managed to clear holster, shoot, 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 shoot six shots. Let's see that. You say that one's three times faster. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> shoot six shots into the very centre of the target and put his gun away before anyone else had cleared. <coughs> And when it came time to go, he cleared and ran after people on horseback. People were already intimidated, and that freaked them out a little bit. They went after him, they formed a posse, it ended up with the person that was declared the leader of the posse was this Jeremiah Stormblow. It's like, we want to follow the adventure, we've got to team up with him. I hate him. I've killed him! <laughs> oh, so they changed. There was a big shootout in an underground cavern system somewhere, and Constantine was there. So you had villains, party, and Constantine in the middle just shooting the fuck out of things. They crawl into the end of this, of this <coughs> building, look around, and there's Constantine. Jeremiah Storm turns to the rest of the party and says, If this goes wrong, he goes around the corner, pulls his guns, and says, Constantine, you're under arrest. Ooh. Twelve shots straight through Jeremiah Storm, bang on the floor. Everybody goes, right. <laughs> I think we'd better run. This is one way of guiding the players to say, not now. <laughs> right? yeah. 
they eventually find out that Constantine is the creation of the mad scientist. He's a clockwork man in a rubber skin that was nicely painted up. It was later on that they, they figured out that he wasn't actually the main villain, but they had to take him out because he would gone a bit. There was a spring loose, literally. Right? Because the mad scientist, his daddy, had died. And yet, outside Fort 51, the final showdown, there's Constantine on the train track shooting at the rangers that are flying about to their jetpacks. Right? <laughs> they have big fucking hand cannons because they've just robbed the place. But they know that not a lot is going to... He's standing on the train tracks. He's sta Train! <laughs> fucking plow into him. They, it took about five minutes to get the train up to speed. He was fired off out, up to speed, and smashed into the clockwork man. The train derailed. Big explosions. Everything is just going fucking nuts. There's, and they go... Thank fuck for that. And I just sit there and go... I went online to talk to people who were into deadlines at the time. I said, I've got a sort, I want to run the next adventure, but I don't know whether it should be the quick and the dead, or from Terminator, or from Predator, or from this, or from that. And a few people were saying, well, you, you could use this, and somebody just went, use them all! <laughs> Put them all in, and I went, you know that all right then. <laughs> the best adventure I've run in a very long time was the Silver Lake one, and I still back on about it. That was about five years ago that I ran that, maybe more. Right, but Constantine, it was great. About towards the end of the campaign, they're on a train. They're going to the final adventure, and there's a mad scientist in the compartment with them who goes spare one day. Right, this train journey is going to take five days. Go spare. They calm him down. They find out his, his blueprints, some of his blueprints have been robbed. It's like, cool, we'll help you. Hire us. Right? We're cheap, we're rich enough already. Hire us to look. Yeah, fair enough. Right? What is it you've lost? I've lost some blueprints that was willed to me from a friend for this clockwork man invented. They went, we've got to fucking find them and burn! <laughs> right. I recognize that name. What would they call? No, it's a clockwork man. It looks like, it looks great. Right. I can't tell you what to do. I mean, stories come up all the time. You find them in books and films and occasionally they tell it. Fairy tales. Fairy tales. What I can give you, however, is a structure for a system that works and I use nine times out of ten. Right? Has anyone here ever heard of the three act? One, two, three, right. Does anyone understand the three act structure? Right. The three act structure is nice and simple. And here's where act one. Right. Act one can be as short or as long as you like. For my game, since I like to jump straight in, it's fairly short. Right? But Act 1 is the setup. Right? If I can even spell it right, it's only five fucking letters. The setup is the background. Where you are in the world, what your characters are, what they look like, and more importantly, why you, as a team, are together. Right? It can be as simple as the five of you meet in a pub. Right? Um, one thing that I always run, and strangely enough, it's, it's great because I could fuck about the timelines all alike, 
is I actually get the players, once they create the characters, is I'll give them a place in time and space and tell them they have to come up with a reason to be there. Right? So if I want to start a Deadlands game, I've actually, on any number of occasions, said, right, I want you to figure out a reason why you'd be on a train headed east out of Denver. So, right? Going back home on a mission, doing whatever, we'll work it out from there. But you're on a train headed east out of Denver. The actual party dynamics start because I'll shove you all into the same train carriage. Mm -hmm. Right? But it's the setup. And that's. It actually gives you the full on atmosphere of where you are in the world. And this is where you, as the GM, have the right at this point to spout your dribble <coughs> in half hour. Right? The world is this shape. Right? The reason why these things are happening are this. Right? If it is a Dungeons and Dragons style world, fuck it. You're in medieval England, you're in a pub, you want a beer. Right? A lot of the people can grasp it. The Old West, it's that simple. Right? You know what the Old West looks like. If you've created your whole new world, you go with it. In Starship Thinking, that <laughs> lasts for precisely 12 seconds as I say, you're in a box, you have no memory. That's it. That's how Starship, star Starship Thinking starts. <coughs> that is the transition into the main plot. That point there is where Luke Skywalker's home is burned. Right? It's where Clark Kent moves to, spawn, moves to Metropolis. Right? Or as I like to put it, A N J I. Anyone want to make a guess as what A and J I stands for? And then and, nin and ninjas jumping. <laughs> you're sat in a pub, you're having a and ninja jumping. Straight away into the action. That could take as little as three minutes as 